course, like many young people, watched porn. I remain open, open-minded, and like I said, time will tell. You know, young people are, are, can be considered sort of the innovators when it comes to content creation. It's all about just chasing this algorithm. And that's kind of sad, because mm -hmm. I'm a product of the internet. Hey everyone, my name is Erin Ashley Simon. I'm a broadcaster, entrepreneur, and a cultural disruptor who's redefining what it means to be a creator. Welcome to Real Gems. I made Real Gems because I want to create a place for your favorite creators to be themselves, to be honest, and to give the real deal about what it means to have a career in front of the camera. Today's guest is a special one. Not only because she's my friend, but also she has done a tremendous job redefining who she is, her brand to the world in a society that constantly puts people in boxes and especially people who have come from a profession that she started in when she was younger but is no longer in please welcome dj writer streamer actress model ho girl it could go on and on please welcome sasha gray tomorrow's a new day tomorrow's you know? <laughs> a new day I, I want you to be my hype woman everywhere i go please I, I'm here. I'm here. I already <laughs> told you. Listen, I'm here for whenever you need me. Like I said, you're my friend. And I am going to lie. I, I was a little bit nervous with this conversation because we've never talked. I, I mean, even with me, we never talked about our past. Like, we kind of yeah. just like, yo, you want to get food? Let's talk about food. Let's yeah. talk about other stuff, right? Exactly. You know? And and then when I found out, like, <laughs> the first time you put ja, 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 I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, Sasha, that's not his <laughs> What? But, like, <laughs> That just, oh, it, it opened the, the door in terms of who you are. And I kind of want to open up the door a little That's bit funny. with the audience. And I want to start with your beginnings. You know, you moved to LA when you were young. Um, you got into the adult film industry. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your beginnings. So I graduated high school a year early. I'd always been like a really good student, but that last year of high school, I just kind of became a nihilist and started seeing things differently. And I, I, like there were questions I had and nobody had the answers to them. And I was like the last of my friends to lose their virginity. Mm. And I became very interested in different aspects of my sexuality that weren't okay to talk about with most people. Mm. And I, of course, like many young people watched porn and- Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just disclaimer, who doesn't? <laughs> And so, yeah, it was something that I, I was drawn to. I, I saw it as a place to explore my fantasies in a safe space because mm -hmm. at the time, for you youngins out there, there were like message boards like Craigslist, things like mm -hmm. this. And those things were very off-putting to me. They didn't feel safe. Um, it's usually like the cliche of much older people and it didn't feel like something that, um, again, would be safe for me. So. I started looking into the industry more. I, I started making lists of different companies and different agencies. And then right after I turned 18, I took a bunch of photos. I sent them to agencies and like nobody was answering the phone. Nobody was calling me back or emailing me back. And I still came to LA, came here for like a week just to look at different neighborhoods and where I might want to live. And still nobody would meet with me. So I was like, I'll use this as an opportunity to come down and hopefully connect with an agency. And um, nothing, like zero. I'm on my way home, back to Sacramento, I'm from Sacramento, I'm on my way back home, and I'm, I'm on the freeway already, and I get a call from this agent, and he's like, yeah, I got your email. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that? <laughs> oh, like this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I got your email. Are you, if, you're really, if you really look like your pictures and you're really into this and you have your own car and cell phone, yeah, I'll meet you. And I was <laughs> like, uh, okay, I'll be back in LA in a week. And he was like, okay, give me a call. And his name is Mark Spiegler and he is, uh, he was my first and only agent in the adult mm -hmm. industry. So yeah, when I came back to LA a week later with my belongings, the little belongings that I did have, came here, I was living in a pool house in North Hollywood, rented out because I had no credit score. We know how that goes yep. when you're 18. And yeah, I was shooting my scene, my first scene within about a week of being here. So it all happened very quickly. Yeah, I, I wrote this mission statement that I sent out to different agencies along with my photos and in it, 
I don't remember it verbatim, but like it essentially was that I wanted to explore my sexuality, Mm -hmm. but also encourage other people to explore theirs and not feel like this shame and guilt that I had. Um, I grew up Catholic. uh, Mm. So there was a lot of a lot of guilt that I had um, about my fantasies. And I wanted people to feel confident in exploring themselves without being judged for it. And yeah, that's that's how it all began. Wow. You know, it's fascinating because like you you still have those the, those those values and those that mm. that reason, that purpose. You still have it till today. I mean, like even when we have that conversation, like even when we're on Ven with the gray area mm. and then like just even the other things. You're you're always about people being comfortable mm-hmm. and sex positivity and you know, I, you were one of the best like you were oh, thank you you were award-winning and so you started to get in movies you started to get kind of like a entertainment mainstream cross mm-hmm. yes what do you say like cross promotion like you started to kind of like make your way into just the mainstream area mm-hmm. like how was that for you especially you, you were at a very young age too wow it was challenging you know now i feel like it's probably different i think mm. because of the internet and social media i think people are a lot more savvy um they have a lot more tools at their disposal yeah. so like i was going into interviews and it was like i was bait to shark you know what i mean mm. no matter how much i knew i still didn't know if that uh, makes okay, sense that makes sense i kn- i know I, f- I always felt like i had to have my defenses up and people would spin things the way they wanted to spin them for their own benefit. Um, but to say that, you know, you don't have, I had a booking agent. It's mm. a booking agent. That's it. Think of it like a modeling agent. A modeling yeah. agent just books you jobs. That's it. Nobody's there coaching you. Nobody's there telling mm. you, like, this is how you handle these situations. So it was sort of up to me to navigate this space and figure it out on my own. After, like, my first one or two small experiences, I would start to, like, sort of rehearse things before I went into a situation just because I started getting burned so many times. Yeah, it was it was definitely interesting. I can't I can't even imagine, you know, it and that's why I'm very curious about this conversation. And also another reason why I know people are probably like not used to me being like extra careful because like at the end of it, like you're my friend and I know this is a this is an important conversation, but it kind of goes back to what we talked about where it's like I wanted to frame this conversation in a, in a great way because you're you're so positive about things and um and i've learned so much from you and i and i love how just like open and honest you are uh, especially when you're in like a space like we said where where people are probably judging you before they even meet oh, yeah. you and when you decided to retire from the industry and you at 21 and you decided to make that transition what did that journey look like and what were the lessons and the things that you took away from that experience you say i'm positive look <laughs> You don't want to see me off camera. You know, it's really easy to stay (laughs) negative. It really, truly is. And that's, it's, I think for everybody, it's always a constant battle. Like, I just don't want to be that person that's outputting um, that sort of negative mindset, especially because you see it so much. Like, I can't tell you how many times I just have to close my phone, delete Instagram or Twitter for a week, mute people because it's just a constant feed of negativity. I don't need to put that out into the world. I don't think it's necessary. Um, Anyways, how did I navigate that transition? Um, Was that the question? Yeah. How did I navigate that transition? It wasn't overnight. It wasn't something that I just decided from one day to the next, like, okay, I'm done. It was a combination of several things that were happening at the same time. I had finished... um, I just finished the girlfriend experience. I was doing a lot of press for that. And it was it was like a year, almost a year of nonstop press. Um, I'd done another film called, a small Canadian film called Smash Cut. I was working on a photography book. And I'd started and stopped a company in the span of like less than a year in the adult industry. And I felt like every side or both sides wanted me to pick a side. And I wasn't willing to do that. I truly wasn't. And it was 2009, end of 2009. So I, this company I had failed. The economy had crashed the year before, and we were all still recovering. It wasn't even, uh, we hadn't even come back yet. And I saw all these other opportunities around me. I was also making music. And it 
it was just natural. Like I said, it wasn't one day to the next. I didn't even talk about it for two years because it just didn't seem necessary. I, I wanted and was existing in both worlds despite what people wanted me to do and people wanted me to take a, a stance one way or the other and I just didn't think it was necessary and I decided to figure it out on my own time, on my own terms. So it was definitely difficult because there was a lot of uncertainty. You know, you go from being a big fish in a small pond, as they say, to like navigating this new world and being completely unsure if any of it's gonna work or not, but just taking it day by day. <laughs> but how has that impacted as you've been building your business? I mean, you've been, you're, you're a big streamer, you're, you're doing a lot of big projects, and I, and, I have, and I feel like there's probably still brands and businesses and people you interact with that either still hold your pass over your head or can't look like like they can't interact with you mm -hmm. as like you're a professional, you're a mm -hmm. businesswoman. They're thinking as a consumer, if right. that makes sense. Well, it's sort of twofold. I think I, I know I learned a lot about my self-worth in the industry. And I know there can be a lot of people that will twist that and, and say and think what they want, but I really learned how to negotiate for myself, how to stand up for myself. And as a young woman, that's difficult in any industry, but especially when where you're selling your body, right? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's what most people looked at it. I look at it as art. Most people look at it as just the black and white, what it is. And I think those experiences of learning how to negotiate for myself and stand up for myself built the foundations for what was sort of necessary to, in what was coming uh, in my future. There's not one right answer. I, I've worked with different teams. I've worked with different publicists and management companies and agents. And all along the way, at the end of the day, like you, you learn how to communicate with your team, right? And if you feel like there is a missing link or a missing piece, it's the same for anybody, despite your background, you have to move on and, and, and find somebody that's compatible with you. And that can be really challenging, especially, um, I used to talk a lot about sexism, but I, the, the older I got and the more reflecting I did, I realized a lot of things were ageism. A lot of things were based on the fact that I was young and inexperienced and people were telling me what they thought was best. And, and sometimes I would, put too much trust into people or like I had a great idea and people shot it down and today I would absolutely go after that idea even if it was going to be a failure yeah. like or you know nothing is certain but like yeah I today I would have made different decisions than I did then for sure um but yeah I I think I think the industry gave me the tools and experience to deal with people and feel confident in decision making uh, in addition to that, I mean, what do you feel like was the most important lesson that like viewers who are, are tuning in can take away? Because like whenever we talk about hardships and obstacles and challenges, people vent a lot about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people feel like these obstacles, these hurdles are preventing them from being successful. But in actuality, <laughs> I think that obstacles and hardships are just kind of like I view them as kind of like pause periods mm -hmm. to figure out what do I need to do to adapt to change. Exactly. It could even be the simplest thing as like maybe someone on your team is not up to par. Maybe exactly. you're you know you're posting on the wrong day. Like really a pause to just reflect mm -hmm. and see what can I do differently. So for you when you're going through these you know this new journey, uh, this new redefining rebranding journey. You know, what's the most important lesson that you learned as you were overcoming these obstacles? I don't know if it was just one, but it's true. I, I think trusting my instinct is one of the most important things. Definitely. Yeah, if, if you don't trust your instinct and if you don't go after what you want, then you're letting other people make decisions for you. I remember... I, I was like 20 or 21 and I had an older friend who said to me, well, I had two friends. One said, you have to know failure. And at that point, I don't, I think I was about 20 because 21 is when the company went under. So like around that age, they said, you don't know failure. And I was, and you know, in my mind, I'm like, what do you mean I don't know failure? I know failure, but I didn't say that, but I, I of course thought it to myself. And then I had another friend who, who said, you're just not experienced enough. And we we're talking about something that I had written. And they said, you're just not experienced enough. You don't have enough life experience. And again, I'm sitting here like, don't have enough life experience. What are you talking about? And even just like two, three, four years ahead of that, I start to, you know, everything in life, uh, 
that presents itself as a challenge is a learning experience mm -hmm. and that that makes you stronger that makes your character grow so at the end of the day i do i do think a lot of it is tenacity not giving up and and failing and learning to accept failure because it does make you stronger and also kind of going back to what you mentioned about ageism right when we talk about creators they always look at young creators mm -hmm. like in high school or in college but I've also seen people who found success later on in, in the creator economy. I mean, you and I are in our 30s and I feel like we are starting, like we're finding our strides. Yeah. And it's a little bit later than some other yeah. people, but it kind of goes back to like what we talked about where like even when we talk about creators, they always talk about the young ones. They never really talk about the older ones that are finding success later on. Well, so much has changed in such a short period of time. The speed at which we, we see new content or get new content there's so much out there uh even in the past five years things have just changed drastically and so i think you know young people are are can be considered sort of the innovators when it comes to content creation um they get they get people to follow them and it's an exciting journey because you feel like you are part of their life um this whole idea of like the parasocial relationship between creators and uh, their audience all of these things are so new yeah. um, but I was actually this is kind of like it goes off a little bit in Go the ahead. opposite direction but <laughs> I was thinking about this like watching tv series if you think about it even before social media I think serial television sort of had the same effect is that yes we love movies but tv oh man every week we get to see this character and it's relaxing because it's familiar so no matter how basic the storyline is or how or how poorly written it is or how poorly directed it is, you still show up because you like those characters. So I feel like content creation, m social media now is sort of filling that void. And you also see it because of declining numbers in TV um, and so much competition in the space. But people's consumer habits have definitely changed. I think for us, like we've seen both sides of it. We've seen the before and we see what's happening now. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a different challenge because you're learning to grow with it and grow with it gracefully and not try to act like you're some 18 year old doing a TikTok dance. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I, when I got TikTok, no. I was like, I can't. I can't do this. No. I'm mm -hmm. gonna leave the dancing for the club. Yep. That's that's off the gram, yeah. off the talk. That's why I DJ. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel you on that. And you know, uh, one thing that I, I see with you especially is is you're very much about representation, social awareness. You know, you even like I got to give you thanks for helping me raise funds for the HBCU Esports oh, yeah. League. No, I really appreciated that. And you're not afraid to do those things. And I, and I also feel like sometimes, which is rightfully so, right? I feel like creators and talent who are as big as you are, you know, of course there's gonna be that fear of backlash, fear of just the craziness that comes with like, speaking up for things you find, think are right and speaking mm -hmm. up for things just like, that are that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. and, and so for you, how do you navigate that? I don't feel I have a choice really. It's, it's natural, it's part of who I am. Um, I come from, a marginalized industry where people are treated like the scum of the earth from certain people um, so I understand um, to a point obviously I understand what it's like to be on the other side um, I also grew up in a incredibly diverse neighborhood um, I had friends and family of different backgrounds um, so when I see injustice it does not rests well with me if i have an opportunity to use my platform and my voice to help other people out it's a no-brainer like and you see a lot of performative action mm, on yeah. social media and you know i might not out be out here raising a million dollars for a incredibly large corporate charity but i know the money that i do help raise goes a lot further <laughs> <laughs> and that's important to me you know I I am um, there's some some people here in LA some friends of mine uh, knock LA and ground game LA organizations that work directly on the street with people that are in need um, helping low-income families find housing uh, translation services for people that need it um, I mean they do it all and they're on the ground and again if I could use my 
my platform and my reach to do something no matter how small then then I'll do it but I can't lie like we talk about information and how fast we get information sometimes it's overwhelming sometimes yeah. it's super emotional um and I think that's fine you have to go through those emotions sometimes I have to again like shut it all down delete the apps for a week or so um but then you think about the people that don't have that luxury you know because their life doesn't exist on these apps the real injustices are not happening online um and i think it's really easy to like again be performative online with your words and, yeah. and cute posts but that only goes so far <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then you, you also just gotta realize the internet is just a portion of the world it's not it really all is. of the world it's not every single person even though it sometimes feels like that on certain platforms but it's really not and plus, girl, I knew you were I knew you were part of the fiesta when you sent me that text. Like, Mike, she sent me the text with like the ja 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 and I, I was like I was like, excuse me? <laughs> what? That's how I knew you came from a diet. That's why I was like, wait, who, who did who you grow this? up around? <laughs> who did you grow up around? Um, but no, I think that's great. I, and I also think like you talked about just some of the obstacles that you had to overcome. And one of them was like, you know, you talked about being taken advantage of and all these different things. And I'm very curious as your friend, because I'm sure you put me through this process. I mean, who doesn't? I put people through this process. How do you differentiate and, and, and what kind of process do you go through to determine if someone's actually there for you versus like oh i'm just here to be close with sasha because she's popping she got a lot of followers like how do you know when it's genuine and when it's not time always tells like time is the revealer of truth so time reveals all truths i should say i i think you i I might come off reserved, and I am, just because I'm, I'm a little bit shy when I first get to know people, but I'm also just a little bit quiet. I'm also the loudest person you can meet as well. So it really depends, like, which day you get me or what we're doing, what so we're So whether we're to. doing dinner acts. Or yeah, or. exactly. <laughs> I think the thing is I don't want to be that person that closes myself off to other people, mm -hmm. ever. I think it's too easy to do that. It's too easy to be in your own bubble. Um my biggest concerns really are just like my personal safety, just from having gone through really terrible situations. That's my primary concern. So I have like ways to take care of that. But in terms of like the more superficial in getting to know people, um, I, I still, I just try to stay open. I remain open, open-minded. And like I said, time will tell. Um, sometimes it's obvious very obvious yeah. and you can see right through it and then you know you can just cut it but at the end of the day we all wear a mask anyways yeah. we all we all thrive better in certain situations than others and you just have to like keep on keeping on but i want i want to hear what, what you okay. do. i think we <laughs> talked about this but i don't remember oh uh, i think yeah i think we talked about it over like i think me you and, and our gang Sorry, not a, it's not an actual gang. It's just friends, folks. Okay, uh, we talked about it over dinner, I think, because this is something I think that we all encounter, right? Where for me, I mean, I've never been like I'm not a name dropper. Like I'm someone who yeah. I'm not gonna tell you who I know, yeah, because I feel like that obviously contributes to people wanting to get close to you, right? Like it's actually funny the amount of times that people are like, "Oh my god, you're friends with Sasha?" I'm like, "Yeah." Like we both worked mm -hmm. at Ben, like, yeah. But I'm not gonna like I'm not the kind of person that's gonna go around and be like, oh, yeah. you know, exactly. like, because my thing is my relationships with my friends are my relationships with my friends, and I wanted to be something special, and I wanted to be just what it is. But I I think one of the things is I don't do that. Also, uh, it's a, it's a lot easier in LA than in New York to do it. I like to do one on ones. Yeah, I like to have like meeting up one on ones, one on one conversations. Yep or one-on-one -on -one dinners and see if actually people follow through with it. Yeah. And if they follow through it more than once. Because people in LA will say, hey, let's hang. And then they'll never do it. More than once. That's yes. the key right there. Yes, That's more the than right once. There. And and having some consistency in that. And I'm also like, I also observe in the conversations. Like, mm -hmm. what do we talk about? What kind of energy do you put in the conversation? Mm -hmm. Is it positive? Are you gossiping? 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how those. Much, how much concern do you have for other people? Yeah, how many concern? How much concern? Right are you passionate about something? Yeah. Are you just asking me about work stuff? Right? Like, is it is it a fun conversation? Like, I mean, granted, sometimes we do. I mean, we talk about work. We yeah, bend we about work do, stuff, but, but like, it, to what extent? Right? You're not and, di- you're not digging for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, if you don't mind, if just an example with us, uh, we talk. I when you brought up that you were by in Mm -hmm. the show i was like wow she just said this on just like just casually what the hell okay and you know for a period of time i was still kind of like kind of going back and forth about being open and stuff like and obviously like now i am like (laughs) i can't hide it. i got short hair people assume anyway (laughs) they assume they're like lesbian (laughs) um (laughs) but You know, I was talking to you because I was very curious and like just you were like we didn't even meet yet. We knew we worked in the same company. Yeah. But you were just like so open and like with me asking questions and you were just like you were there in a very comforting way about me just being like asking questions. Mm -hmm. And then like from there I was like, oh, you know, I'd love to connect. And you were like, yeah. And you went through with it. And I think like that was such a genuine interaction that that really told me okay she's she's a genuine person like yeah. she really is like a, a you know a good a good person and i think that's 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 for me how i've been able to tell and like experience right exactly I, we're at yeah. a point now where like i could sniff it out in a second from yeah. like a 15 minute conversation and be exactly. like oh okay yep yeah i see what you want <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i mean but also you 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 met good people and you've met friends and and so for you like you know people may feel like you can't make friends people may feel like it's hard and challenging but for you like you have so like what about like the the positive side of it like you know because you're so true to yourself i'm sure that gravitates other people who are like-minded yeah it's it's incredibly difficult to make real friends right like you have layers to it you have layers you i have friends that i would never introduce other friends to because also because I know they're not going to get along, but definitely being in this city um, in itself is a challenge. I think any major city is, but especially LA. Um, look, I bond over like very simple things at the end of the day, good food and good conversation. <laughs> and if you can get down like that, then we're probably gonna be friends. Like I can't stand people that don't eat. It drives me insane. <laughs> If I cook for you and you're like doing this, twirling your food and hardly taking a bite, I know we're not going to be great friends. I know, I know it right then and there. Um, but yeah, you know, I also have friends that I care deeply for that I know if if I was in dire need of something, I could call them up and they would help me. And I never see them. Yeah, I've they don't like live that. here. You know what I mean. But mm-hmm. I have friends in in other cities. I have friends in other countries, and I know like if I really needed something, that they're there for me. And some people you just connect with, and you vibe with. Like yeah, it is it is what it is. Yeah, now I have friends like that too, and friends who it doesn't matter how successful or not successful I am in my career. Like they're they're always there. Well, that's interesting too, though, right? Like. People, a lot of people want to be there when you're when you're riding that wave yeah. up. That's that shows you a lot too. Yes, that's another side of it that a lot of people don't really reflect on or talk about. Yeah, but who's there for you during those when you're periods? Just kind of floating. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? I've kind of had that period recently because I'm going through my transitional phase where mm-hmm. I don't want to just be in gaming. Yep, yeah. and. I feel like I've hit a lot of big success points in gaming and I'm like, you know, like there's more things I can do, but I was like, I feel like I've done a lot in a very short period of time. And, and I want to transition, but part of transitioning is like my agent, my publicist, they're all like, Hey, you're going to have to like start kind of moving away from gaming, not talking about it as much and all that. Mm -hmm. And I noticed like since then, like, you know, people, I'm sure people think like, Oh, Aaron's not doing anything. She fell off, right? Like the same. Some right, of the people, your focus has shifted. Yeah, and some of the people who used to hit me up and talk to me, interact to me as much, they aren't doing it anymore, right? And I and I understand some of it's life experience, but I can tell, 
I can tell which ones are something else, mm-hmm. right? But I think during these moments, I, I don't know, maybe I'm weird. I actually like these moments because people who are, you truly know who's there for you during those periods. Mm-hmm. So when you do rebrand, you do change, and you do glow up, those are the people you want to rock with. It's the quiet moments. It is. Mm-hmm. The quiet, calm moments. Mm-hmm. But which blows my mind, though, and, and, and I definitely want to hear from your experience. I feel like the... The calm moments, people always associate those calm moments for like, oh, they're not maybe up to anything. When in actuality, like a lot of times the calm moments is you're working on a project, you're building it up. You're, gr- you're, you're grinding. You're grinding, you're yeah. doing the work, and yep. then you're going to have like a big oh, presentation yeah. thing for it, you know? Like for you, have you ever had that period of quietness? And like, what was that period yeah, like for you? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> you're like, time. I'm home I, quiet all the time. I, I wear so many different hats, and... I think probably the the most intense period was like when I was writing my first novel mm. because I just, sh- I had to shut myself off from the world. There was no choice. I was on a deadline, you know, I got paid. I had, this had to be done. There was no choice whatsoever. Um, the second and third were not easier to write, but let's say like I had more time. Time is a luxury. So yeah, I've definitely done that. And and when you're writing, it's a different beast. It's not um, it's not the public-facing part of what I do um, or what I'm known for. And that was actually really nice. Mm-hmm. I, liked, I liked stepping away. But when you live in and work in a town and in an industry that is so dependent on your presence is definitely a challenge for sure. Yeah. And that's actually like where social media used to help more. Now I feel like social media, it's not even about you as a person or your passions or your interests anymore. It's all about just chasing this algorithm. And that's kind of sad because mm-hmm. I'm a product of the internet. I, I built my career because of the internet, mm-hmm. um, as did a lot of people I know. And I think that sort of special part of sharing those interests or your passions Um, or your projects right like not every piece of music I've worked on is just blown up but I'm okay with that and I like what I'm doing Um, and it's like harder it's almost harder and harder to reach your audience in a way that's actually talk about like learning how to grow and change when we have no control over those things that's incredibly challenging it's pay to play now. Mm-hmm. It's pay to play. Or just stuff your face in a chocolate cake like Matilda. Yeah. And like that. That too. You know, that, that worked for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're going on your journey, obviously it's not only a career shift, but it's a shift as you as a person. Did you have moments where you outgrew people around you, outgrew people in your immediate circle? And what was that experience like? Because I know, hmm. you know, I know that sometimes people get really sad because people who are there from the beginning are no longer part of the journey. And that's sad. You know, there is mm-hmm. a grieving period that comes with that. Like you lose friends, you lose people that were with you. Um, but it's important that like you can't hold yourself back as you are expanding and growing as a person. Right. So what was that like for you? Yeah, because I actually I pride myself on communication and a lot of people don't know how to communicate. So when you see that a lot of, a lo- let's say like in my early, tw- in mid twenties, a lot of friendships that I had uh, that just kind of fizzled out were because of, I don't want to go like too deep into it, but, and call people out, but it's, it's because of a lack of communication at the end of the day, um, which is sort of when you learn about it later it's like okay well it's fine they didn't really value me anyways um but it can yeah it can be lonely especially when you're younger and you're still trying to find yourself um but again I think like looking at the positive side of things I've been able to travel the world since I was really young and make it part of my job and that's value that I don't want to it can't replace friendships but it builds other relationships and um and, I, and it goes back into those learning experiences, like learning how to communicate with people and how to and and understand what people are actually there for and yeah. why they're there and if they're going to be a, a real friend or a fair weather friend or 
or whatnot. But yeah, I mean, I've also had friends that like, yeah, you just, you know, somebody moves, you get out, yeah. you, you lose touch. And that's a natural part of life as well. Or people have kids. That's a big one. People <laughs> oh, yeah. have kids and it's like, I'll, I still try though, you know, like I don't want to be that friend that let them go. So I still, um, I still maintain contact. Relationships is a weird one. When people get into relationships and then they just cut off the world and you're like, that isn't that what like your like high school, early twenties is about? You're too old to still be doing this. What the <laughs> hell? I know. It's like, you got a life still. You got a life. Yeah, I think I got, what was it? I think this came from a Tyler Perry play where uh, Medea was, I think it was Medea was saying like, people are like trees. There are some people who are like leaves who sway with the wind. There's some people like branches who are there, but when the wind gets really hard, they break off. Mm-hmm. There's some people who are like roots. No matter how hard the wind blows, they're still there yep. at the end. And and I agree. Like and and I've also realized I've kind of learned through therapy is like like you mentioned earlier was like you gotta bucket people off. Like even in friendships, you bucket mm-hmm. people off. You got your party friends. You got yeah. your, you got your introverted friends where it's like let's do game night inside. You yeah. know, like you got all these different kinds of friends, and then you got friends that you can rely on but you may not talk all the time like I have friends who are like that so it's all about just understanding like the placement of where people are in your lives and people Mm -hmm. serve different purposes and that's okay and some people their purpose changed over time it doesn't mean that you're a bad person doesn't mean that they're a bad person it's just life that's happens when you grow exactly and even though success can be lonely it's also beautiful because I feel like I've learned so much about myself and have been learned to be so much comfortable and happy with myself yeah through it because you're kind of like force into that a little bit we know what your priorities are yeah yeah and and that changes a lot it does it does and you know what else changes the new titles you keep adding to your resume i never (laughs) know what you're working on you are a dj a streamer a musician an author everything so i need to ask you what's the next project you're or working on or what you're currently working on and are we gonna have to add a new title CEO. Hey. Ain't <laughs> well, I don't know yet, but it will happen. Um, no, I don't want to be CEO. I just want to be. I mean, I want to be more. I want to be more than. I want to be more behind the scenes than that. You but, are yeah. technically. You're technically a CEO. You're technically, CEO of yeah. your own brand. Yeah. So what's next? Um, I've been working on new music. Um, before pandemic, actually, I started streaming because I wanted to DJ less, and start traveling more for me and not for work so that was odd timing (laughs) really odd timing Uh, that was like 2019 but now i'm back to making some music doing some collaborations still writing here and there uh streaming a lot and that's the thing that i've found probably the most challenging um from this pandemic uh at least long lasting i should say Mm. is that um i've just become so comfortable with streaming and being too comfortable is dangerous so i'm uh i'm still obviously doing that it's like my main focus right now uh because it you know through pandemic it it certainly carried me um but i i know what i need and i know what i crave and yeah getting back out there and and challenging myself to try out some different things and new things that's that's what I'm looking at right now. Is there anything that you're super proud of that you have worked on or currently working on right now? I would say like my, my first novel for sure, because I have been writing since I was a kid Mm. and I tried selling different screenplays. I try, you know, I, I, I broke down so many doors, but like nothing ever got made. I was always at that at that point but nothing ever was made and that opportunity came to me and uh, it was incredibly successful and being able to tour with that Mm. I mean I've traveled after that um DJing but like touring with a book is just a completely different experience um you connect with people in a different way uh, because it's not nightlife and traveling the world and meeting people from all sorts of different backgrounds and different ages Mm. and 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 the women because I think that's um, a misconception is that like you only have dude fans. No, nah, man, like 
the people I met around the world. Um, I never really, I knew that I wanted to encourage people to be themselves Mm -hmm. and, and to take charge in what they wanted out of life. But like you tell yourselves these things and you know, that's what drives you, but to actually meet people face to face and, um, and have them tell it to you is another thing. Yeah. It's another experience completely. And, um, I felt a a greater responsibility after that tour. Um, so that's definitely up there for me. And, um, I wrote a song with death in Vegas, uh, called consequences of love. And it was about my dad who had passed and that got into the mission impossible fallout movie. And that that's like, that's next level. You know, you, you, and that's what I like about making music for me and not for a deadline yeah or for something specific like just making it because you want to be there and and you're passionate about it and then that's the result that was pretty cool man you live like ten thousand lives like i think it's awesome and i really enjoy this conversation because i feel like as your friend like i started to learn more and more about you um which is great and uh but yeah, we definitely bond over food. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're gonna. Have it. <laughs> I was gonna say she said food. I was like, yep, yep. I right, check that one off. Let's do it. Um, but you're good though. Like I, I really appreciate. I was saying this the other night at your birthday. But like I really appreciate how you keep people together, mm. and and you're like that. You're like the bond. You're the bonding. You know, you're <laughs> the bonding material that keeps people together, and it's really easy to not do that it's really easy to just sit inside yourself or your routines so like get out and try new things we went axe throwing i always wanted to do that I, I wait you had, did i didn't yeah, know that. i always wanted to go axe throwing like finally doing this like i never would have put those pieces together because then <laughs> that's me being lazy but yeah, <laughs> yeah i i realized i'm the one that's like always texting the group chat like yeah. we'll be hanging next come on yeah give me a date it's hard <laughs> though man we're all like especially that part of our friend group yeah we're all super busy all of us are always traveling and other sides of the planet so it's not easy and i appreciate yeah. that because uh friendships do take work they do take work, they do absolutely but i appreciate we all make an effort yep. that's the most important thing absolutely so i can go on and on i mean we can keep our conversation on the next dinner hangout but yes. uh i want i always end this podcast with this one question what is the one piece of advice you want the viewers to walk away from what is that one real gem you want to drop? Ooh, I always say challenge yourself and challenge the system. Oh, that's a bar. Yeah, that is a bar. All right, Sasha Gray, the woman with many titles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> really appreciate you for coming on today's episode. Where can they find you on social media? Oh, Sasha Gray everywhere. Yeah, you know, <laughs> everywhere. 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 All on the Almost internet. Blue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got my blue check back. That's weird. Oh. I woke up with it. <laughs> like, oh, we we're so worried. I know. Look at that. I still don't got it. But you know what? I'm verified in these business streets. Thank you so yes. much for everyone for tuning into today's episode. Let me know what part of the episode did you enjoy? What real gem will you walk away from? Drop in the comment section. Make sure you like, follow, and subscribe. We have many more episodes coming up. You don't want to miss the next ones. Another amazing guest. Until next time, my name is Erin Ashley Simon, and you're watching Real Gems. Bye, everyone. <laughs>